since her very first appearance in 1996, Sydney Prescott has steadily worked her way to becoming the ultimate final girl. She has appeared in every screen film and helped defeat the killers in every single one. Not only that, she had an organic and believable arc over the course of all five films. With the recent uncertainty surrounding whether or not Nev Campbell will be returning for the sixth film in the franchise, it got me thinking, can Scream really be Scream without Sydney? Sydney Prescott. No. I'm a really big fan. The final girl as a trope has existed for decades, rising to prominence in the 1970s. While Laurie Strode of the Halloween franchise is often seen as the first true final girl, the archetype did exist before her in characters such as Sally Hardesty from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Jess Bradford in Black Christmas. Both Sally and particularly Jess were more progressive characters, subverting the damsel in distress trope and fighting back against their attackers. These girls represented an empowerment that many real girls and women could relate to. As much as we like to stereotype the final girl trope, the truth is final girls across the horror genre do tend to differ a lot, and the best of them have their own strengths and weaknesses, desires, aspirations, and fears. And there is little doubt that Sydney Prescott is honestly the best of the best. When Scream first hit the screens in the 1990s, audiences were blown away by the humor, horror, sharp meta references, and, of course, its final girl, Sydney Prescott, a young teenager with a tragic past which had resulted in PTSD. The movie starts just as she is starting to get her life back together and sets up an arc with the potential to span more than one film. Kevin Williamson wrote Scream to subvert and poke fun at horror tropes, and he wrote Sydney to deliberately subvert the final girl cliches that audiences so often reduced female horror heroines to. While she was vulnerable and could be soft, she was mostly complicated and angry and suspicious. She also made mistakes, the biggest of which was her incorrectly identifying Cotton Weary as her mother's murderer. Sydney's temper and anger also come out in her interactions with Gail Weathers, a character who is no doubt a morally questionable person with selfish ambitions, who is also the only person championing Cotton's correct innocence. While we can't help but cheer when Sydney socks Gail in the face, it's still a violent reaction and shows that Sydney is human and flawed and can let her emotions get the better of her, all things which make her relatable and endearing to audiences. Like all great final girls, Sydney takes on the villains at the climax of the film and once again subverts a lot of expectations as she stabs, shoots, electrocutes and eventually murders them, taking on horror tropes right up until the end. Careful. This is the moment when the supposedly dead killer comes back to life for one last scare. Not in my movie. While she ends the film triumphant, the door is left wide open to explore her trauma and the repercussions of her accusations against Cotton, both of which the second film picks up seamlessly. Sydney spends much of the second film trying to maintain her natural toughness, but she is still quick to anger, clearly still suffering from PTSD, and is constantly hounded by the media in the wake of the recent murders. She has also attracted a stalker in Cotton Weary, who is desperate to clear his name after Sydney's accusations in the previous film destroyed his reputation. At the end of the film, Sydney tries to atone, so to speak, by shifting the spotlight to Cotton and turning him into the hero of the hour. However, after losing her boyfriend and best friend to the killers, she ends the film without anyone by her side, and it would have been an incredibly sad ending for Sydney had the franchise stopped there. Luckily, there was another film on the way. Scream 3 gets a lot of hate, and it does unfortunately give us less screen time with Sydney due to scheduling conflicts with Nev Campbell. However, it utilizes its time with her so well that she still very much feels like the main character, despite having the least screen time of the main trio. She also has what is maybe her strongest arc in the franchise, possibly only second to the first movie. Sydney starts her time in the movie in almost complete isolation, 
living off the grid in a remote house with extra security measures surrounding and filling the property. She is revealed to only be in contact with two people, her dad and Dewey, and she works from home under an alias. In a very organic piece of characterization, her work is as a women's crisis counselor, channeling her own trauma into helping others, an action which is not uncommon in real life survivors of trauma. Eventually, Sydney is drawn out by Ghostface and comes out of hiding to confront her past, her fears, and her new attacker. She meets new people along the way and has to learn to put her trust and faith in them, in particular, lead detective Mark Kincaid. By the end of the film, she has fully allowed Dewey and Gail back into her life and added Mark to her circle of people. The nature of Mark and Sydney's relationship is left ambiguous emphasizing that the point of including him was not to give Sydney a romantic connection, but to show that she is opening herself up and letting someone new into her life, rebuilding her ability to trust. The final shot of her leaving the back door open with her security alarm system turned off is actually a really strong ending to her character and would have been a great place to leave off. Unfortunately, Scream 4 Sydney is a paler shade of character. Now a published author, she seems to be trying the old, if you can't beat them, join them, by taking her story into the spotlight herself and shaking off her victim status. It's left unclear whether it's working for her, as when Ghostface once appears, she does seem less effective than usual. While there are moments of awesome, and an iconic final line to the villain, You forgot the first rule of remakes, Jill. Don't fuck with the original. Scream 4? is not a great ending for Sydney, and her character feels like she's been somewhat diminished, possibly due to her arc feeling complete in the previous film, thereby leaving the writers of the fourth film little to work with. Which is why Scream 2022 needed to, and thankfully succeeded, in restoring Sydney's tough as nails characterization. In my Evolution of Scream video, I mentioned the struggle that Scream 4 had in trying to balance the old characters and the new. Scream 5 fixes this by writing Sydney as a supporting character and finally moving Ghostface's main focus away from her. She is now allowed to be the older, hardened final girl who comes back in the final act to help save the day. In Scream 5, Sydney is given a piece not afforded to her in previous films. Because she is no longer the final girl, she is allowed to have a life of stability and is shown to have a family to have healed enough to jog in public with her daughter, and she now carries a mobile phone, something she didn't do in Scream 3 or Scream 4. She only returns to Woodsboro when Ghostface murders Dewey, and even then, she remains a supporting character. This is also the first film where she doesn't directly kill at least one of the villains, and it feels like her torch has passed, not because someone took it from her, but because it was time to pass it. The films can't keep Ghostface coming after Sydney for all eternity, eventually that would become old. When Sydney states, No more books, no more movies, no more fucking Ghostface. It feels prophetic. Sydney really has earned the right to walk away into her safe, stable life and bringing her back again runs the risk of redundancy. Not only does Scream 2022 round out Sydney's arc, it gives us two new final girls who feel like they're up to the challenge of filling her very big shoes. Sam and Tara are both interesting and layered characters, both girls shown to be tough, to have issues, fears, and flaws, and they each take out a villain at the climax of the film. Sam's biological link to Billy also provides a connection to the original film and the franchise as a whole. While there is no denying that a big part of the appeal of Scream is Sydney Prescott, and that the franchise would not be the same without her amazing characterization, she is far from the only thing that makes the Scream franchise so popular and entertaining. And if she is removed from the films, there are so many elements that will still be present that should continue to make the franchise enjoyable. Roger Jackson as Ghostface is just as iconic as Sydney, as is the murder mystery aspect that usually surrounds the villain. The meta-references and continual exploration and friendly mockery of the horror genre as a whole, as well as the reflection of the state of the genre through the fictionalized stab movies, has been a constant in the franchise and is always enjoyable and entertaining. 
Lastly, all five films have been superbly directed by directors who know the genre and understand how to scare, shock, and entertain the audience. So maybe it really is Sydney's time to hang up her final girl shoes. Maybe the best ending for her really is the fifth film, one last hurrah where she stands up to Ghostface on her own terms without being manipulated into the situation, because this time around, she isn't the main target. And at some point, hasn't the girl earned the right to have a stable, Ghostface-free life? We have two new final girls ready to make her proud, and a solid team behind the cameras who can continue to make these films fresh, exciting, and entertaining. Ghostface will always be an iconic horror movie villain, and the films provide opportunities for creative and memorable kills. In many ways, it really does feel like the franchise may be able to stand without Sydney. It may be different, but that doesn't necessarily mean it will be worse. <laughs>